Hello and welcome to the New York Empire podcast presented by Greatest Ultimate Bag. I'm Dan Hilton and he's Matt Pippen Aletta. And with week four in the books and the Empire with a week off this weekend, we had time and we get to talk about New York's 1816 overtime victory. Two straight overtimes for the undefeated juggernaut that is the New York Empire with that win over the Philadelphia Phoenix from last Saturday. It seems like, Matt Pippen Aletta, as we begin this conversation, that the Empire... Sans number 87, because I think we're going to start the show by talking about him again. But Sans number 87, they are looking rather human. Yeah, uh, Jeff was amazing, but the rest of the team in a little flux there. I think uh, part of it this week had to do with some of the personnel they had or didn't have. Uh, no Ryan Osgar seemed to really limit the way the offense functioned. They still have a ton of great players out there, so... They played a lot of under small ball and it just, they weren't as dynamic without Ryan. So it kind of just changed the way everything flowed. They, you know, they get the win in the end, but a lot of that was because Jeff scored half the goals. Well, this is coming officially from um, coach Anthony, uh, co-head coach, Anthony Nunez talked to him this morning about the, the Oscar stuff. So they found out on Friday that due to an oblique strain, Nothing serious, but they just wanted to be extra cautious, which means you get two full weeks for Ryan Osgar to take off, basically, after that strain. So, yeah, he was pulled on Friday. The idea is already that Oliver Chartok is going to play some O-line. He did against DC when Elliott was out last week. So it was just a matter of, yeah, you, you lose Osgar and you regain Elliott instead of thinking that Oliver had gone anywhere because he was on the DC O-line last week. But, yeah, let's start with that O-line and let's start with Babbitt. So I obviously cannot take any credit for this, but... After that conversation I had with Jeff after week one against Philadelphia, when he had 0 0 as we mentioned again, since that time, he's been in the end zone basically every minute of every game. It's very close to that. He finished with nine goals, two blocks, 38 of 30 in his completions, 382 receiving yards. I said he started with all zeros. He's now up to 19 goals, one assist, and six blocks. 19 goals is tops of the league if you're not watching anywhere else. With the next closest, two players have 17. And they've played five games to Jeff's four. Uh, and then if it's per game and you had to play more than half the game, so I didn't count anybody who played one game or two game that had a, you know, a big explosion for per game stuff. The total goal getters through four weeks are Jeff with 4.75, Orion Cable with 4.33, Mateo Agi with four for Colorado, Walker Frankenberg from Oakland with four, and Greg Martin and Gam Brock around 3.7. The disc is just flying around in Oakland. So with rookie Frankenberg, I mean, I think he's the one exception to that. <laughs> we'll see what happens over the course of a season. And then AG has moved over to offense for Colorado this year. So he's not doing that from the D-line like he usually would have. So Babbitt, Cable, AG, Martin, Brock, those names all make a lot of sense to me to be leading in goals per game for what is the 2023 season so far. But the way Jeff is doing it, I mean, it's the question would be, is it out of necessity? It feels like it's out of necessity to a point in the last two weeks, or is it that Jeff has just tapped into the, the, the best version of himself as a goal scorer? I think it could be a little bit of both too. Yeah. So a few notes. One, Jeff is unstoppable on, you know, free deep space where the ball's hanging. Uh, but that's not how he's scoring almost any of these goals. This game featured Jeff making maybe one away cut. He basically just ran a few yards from the front of the end zone towards the the back of the end zone and Jack just kind of put it around to space. That was it. It wasn't a deep cut. It wasn't anything impressive. Um, all of his cuts are just beating people to the front of the end zone. Once or twice, he's basically standing still waiting in the end zone because he's already beaten somebody by so much. He just stands there and catches it with his toes in. So yeah, he's, he's hard to stop. Uh, I thought Philly did a really good job limiting his ability in the middle of the field, you know, forcing him under, just playing it safe. They did the same thing with Lithio and, you know, almost turning the two of them into de facto handlers at certain points um, or just, you know, hybrids and not the, the deep beasts you would expect. But then once they got near the end zone, it was almost like they kept backing him or just playing like even with him, like side to side. And that's not where you want to be because Jeff is going to beat you in that race to that, either the front or the cone, you know, wherever he's going to go, he's going to win that race. He's even if your hips are in the right position, he just, bulldozes most people to that space. I, I really think once you're in the end zone, you got to be in between him and the disc facing him. And, you know, then Jack Williams has to throw it out and around. And when it goes out around and up, other players have a little more time to maybe help out on some of that. 
that's really the only way you're going to beat him there. I, I don't think just letting him bulldoze you to a cone is the answer. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the only thing you come out of that uh, O-line, as you mentioned, where Philly may have had their game plan, and I think their game plan was improved defensively, obviously, with the lack of Osgar. I mean, you look at just how, not to say unnatural, but there is a reliance, certainly, and there should be on last year's MVP because his dynamic throwing, his ability to be that release valve where if it's if you're getting stuck, Jack, you look to your left or you look to your right, Osgar, one of the two is always there for you in that space. And when you lose one of those release valves, you're asking other players to do other things that not necessarily that they're not comfortable with, but they're not normally asked to do. And it is repetition. Like this is the second year of this O-line where it seems like everything is a, a fine tooth comb. comb. They know exactly where to be, what to do, when to do it. And so when you do move one of the most essential cogs of all of that, they did look, I feel like it did take, and the numbers agree with me. It took them three quarters really to figure out, to say how, who are we without Osgar? And you look at the, the numbers between the mistakes. Jack had two throwaways and a stall out. You had Elliot with three throwaways. Royce Meyer Bailey with three uncharacteristic throwaways. A reminder, too, that all of 2022, Saul didn't turn the disc over three times in any of those games last season at all. And he had three just against Philadelphia. Two for Charles Weinberg, and then some for the other defenders. And then Lithio also had one, and Yacht also had one while playing in O point. So, I mean, that's a ton of turnovers for an Empire team that usually does not throw the disc away like that and give it away. They tied Philadelphia with 17, but the Empire generally win the turnover battle, always, especially with their O-line. If the DR, they're turning it over, it's because the D-line is being trusted to make mistakes. Um, so, I mean, I don't know. It's this weird thing, Matt, where is there concern for the Empire O-line? Yeah, maybe without Ryan Osgar. But if Ryan Osgar is back, all the concern kind of dissipates. So depending on how he heals from this oblique strain for the next two weeks, we might this I'm not say this, this might not be a talking point at all. Yeah, and you know, for a one game situation, I could see why maybe they the coaches didn't pull anybody over or make massive changes. They just kind of plugged in Oliver since he played great the week before. But with Oliver, Elliot, Weinberg, uh Ruchmeyer Bailey, it they all of a sudden lose a little bit of the dynamicism that they've had. Um and same, especially if Jeff and Lithio are only cutting in. I mean, Lithio has no goals in the game. He has two goals all season, which is crazy to think about because, you know, I think the previous two seasons, he scored 36 in both regular seasons and nine in both playoff campaigns. So, I mean, you know, he is where they should be shooting the disc deep. And without Osgar in the lineup, like you said, some other players took some shots that maybe they wouldn't have just because they felt a tiny bit more pressure. The game was tight. Philly was playing great. And, you know, Osgar's not out there. Um, the other thing with the coaching staff is if if Osgar wasn't available longer or, you know, you just find yourself in this situation again, I mean, move Yacht back over to offense. Absolutely. Not just for a point or two here and there. I mean, he should just be playing offense in that case because he is a good thrower. He finds space. I mean, again, like Jeff and Lithio, he'll probably be backed but he's a little more dynamic of a thrower. You know, he's got all the assists to his name to back it up. I think Jeff, despite having an MVP goal scoring campaign so far, he's got one assist on the season, um, often because he's just catching the goal when they're near the end zone in the red zone. But, you know, he's capable. But, you know, they don't really want to shoot a lot, those guys. So everything kind of just got flatter, got more stagnant. Uh, you know, put you out there, and I think that all opens up again. And, you know... Maybe Oliver doesn't come in as a replacement for somebody that dynamic. Maybe he just is the eighth guy subbing in when somebody needs a break or if one of the players I mentioned earlier isn't available. I, I don't necessarily think he was the best Osgar replacement, even though he's still a great player. Yeah, I mean, we, we saw what he can do as a D-line handler in the past, and he's a big body, can get out there on defense and fight. So, yeah, of course, when things get shortened, when lines get shortened come the postseason, Obviously, that's a long way away. It's months away, and the Empire have their options to do that. I mean, I also said, too, the break glass in case of emergency part two of that that I think you saw and you knew was coming was that JR also goes to the O-line, that you see more Randolph O points, which he had five of in that game, and that's going to happen as well. And I, and I think, too, in the course of that game, even though the O-lines don't play against each other, there is this weird thing, as we're going to talk about the Empire D-line slash the Philly O-line, there is this kind of thing where what kind of game is this? 
And because Philadelphia, and it's funny because the way I talked to Roger Chu and Tom Glass for the Philly coaches before the with the week one matchup, and they were telling me that, yeah, I mean, I know we had the rest, reputation, the reputation of being this huck happy team, but that's not who we are. We're, we're not that that team. And then they wound up not being that team, and they were zero and three. And now the game where they were twelve of twelve on their hucks, or twelve of thirteen, depending on who's taking the stats. And, I mean, but the official AUDL website says twelve of twelve, and you're twelve of twelve on your hucks. They won basically every fifty fifty ball there was that wasn't that end of the third quarter Jack over the top floaty scuba that that. Babbitt brings down, but pretty much every other 50-50 ball, they win it if it's in the air. <laughs> and so Philly, it's one of those things where the closest you get to your first victory of the season is because you are who everyone said that you were in this huck keep happy team. But more importantly to that, though, the we'll say the changes that they made was that Mott handled. That was the bigger thing more than anything else, was that it was Handler Mott getting into the backfield and making good choices with his throws and just being dynamic with those throws. And then a credit, too. That Greg Martin and James Pollard, a phenomenal day. Pollard made, we'll say, a little bit of history because no player against the Empire over the last, what, two seasons has had 600 receiving yards, four goals, and four assists on the same day. He just, Pollard ran rampant all over in the deep space. Uh, and again, it's it's not even defensively that I think Yacht played poorly. It's that Pollard was, he was A-plus on his positioning, on his timing, uh, and then he was everywhere he needed to be. So sometimes it's, you know, it's the same thing with basketball. Sometimes instead of saying, you know, the defense did something wrong, sometimes you tip your hat and say that offense was just great. I mean, same thing with Martin. When it was JR on him early in that game, Greg Martin just came down with everything as he does against Phil, uh, New York historically. It didn't in week one, but Martin came down with everything. And then when Antoine, who's a bigger defender, switches on, Martin slowed down a little bit. And then that allowed JR to move on to Calvin Tesselini, where he got he gets two big blocks in that game. And again, JR was also filtering in on offense at that point. But once that change happened, yeah, the O line for Philadelphia slowed a little bit. So the Antoine switch was, I don't, that's understated. You know, that was also information that Coach Nunez pointed out to me. Important to note that. And then Chun Moy filtering in on that Philly O line as well, like adding their piece, which is one of the variables we can add. And the way that the Empire add Yacht or JR, Chun Moy is a talented player, one of Philly's, we'll say, a top five most talented players. So moving him onto the O line is helpful because he can do a lot of things for you. And also, if you give the disc away, Chen Moy can, is one of those players that can help you get it back if you're an O-line for Philadelphia. So I want to, instead of <laughs> disparaging, because I did, I was thinking, I'm watching the game, I'm like, is this the worst combined game that I've seen from Yacht and Katz at the same time? Like, have Ben Katz and, and Ben Yacht together had such an ineffective game at the same time? I, I can't remember a game where the two of them just had such a little impact. But instead of, you know, questioning if they're doing something wrong, I want to give credit to the fact that the Philly O-line was the team that feels like they shouldn't be 0-4. Like, they should have won at least two of the games that they played so far. Yeah, that, that Philly team is good. I mean, it's a shame in some sense that they're in the East where they have to play New York and D.C. Um, their remaining schedule is also tough. They play D.C. again. They have to play Pittsburgh, which I think Philly might be better than Pittsburgh, but I could see that being a toss-up. And then they play Carolina, too. So, you know, that schedule is going to be really tough for Philly. It That third playoff spot might be out of reach. But from a talent standpoint, I mean, they just played three close games against Boston, New York, and D.C. As you said, like, they're pretty good. If they were in a different division, you know, maybe they are, you know, easily in the playoff hunt as opposed to just, like, hoping they can scrape together enough wins for the rest of the season to, you know, claim that third spot. But, yeah, they, they're great. And uh, you didn't mention Jordan Ryan, but, you know, I think he personally turned it over twice and then immediately got it back both times too. So even when they did make mistakes, they, they got it back very quickly. The, the entire offense played great. Yeah. And on the other side, one of the things that we saw from New York to also defensively, how did they change it up? Saw a lot more of Ryan and Mike Dross there in that second half playing on that O-line. So Ethan Fortin had his, his points played cut a little bit there in the second half. He was playing with Yacht and Katz and Randolph and Marquez and, and Antoine Davis on that, on that, we'll say, primary D1 line or whatever it is. And then, you know, again, his points were slashed a little bit as the Dross kind of took over. And Ryan Dross right now, through only three games played, not four, so per game average is leading the team in blocks. That fourth quarter block was huge. Just thinking to myself when he got that, I said, the Empire, I mean, this, it really was a toss-up, I think, until that moment. As, as much as even in with 36 seconds left when Jack had that almost his second stall out of the game, when he did that pirouette and then he threw that, that low flick hook and 
again, before that, when Ryan gets that, that block in the fourth, that's what told me that the Empire knew that they could win that game. Yeah, especially, you know, the Dross could probably play a little more earlier in the game, but I understand why they necessarily aren't and how they kind of play them a little more as the game goes on. And when you have two fresh Drosts against other players who are maybe a little more tired than they were earlier in the game, that's a game changer. I mean, the acceleration Ryan had on that to just pick that throw off, that was, you know, is he 20? Is he 30? It's hard to tell. Just, yeah, he just gets it and goes and that's it. Um, going up. Yeah. And <laughs> 30 is. also just, you know, slowly creeping up on Mike. Mike's got 192 blocks, one all time. Uh, Ryan has way more so far this season. Um, Mike's going to be kicking himself because he hit a few discs in that very first game, but they were still completed or somebody else deed them, which Mike doesn't get credit for that then on, on the stat sheet. But yeah, uh, Mike 192, Ryan 189. It's getting real close. And they can claim till they're blue in the face that they don't care who's one and two as long as they're both one and two. But that's not true. I refuse to believe that. They care. Oh, they do. They do care. Yeah. I ask them after every game, what number are you at? And yeah. they can tell me. Oh, they know. Are. Yeah, yeah. But they yeah. they try and be friendly and be like, oh, as long as it's just us, you know. But no. Yeah. No. Ryan wants to well, pass we, him. I would be shocked to find out otherwise. Well, we have said before, Mike actually has admitted and knows that it, it will likely be Ryan at the end of this year. Because be, Ryan, I mean, Mike had 42 in that first year in 2013. And since that time, Ryan is outpacing him by like seven blocks per year, just just numerically over the last nine years since that time. So Mike knows that for the better part of the entire decade, Ryan Dross has gotten more blocks than Mike has. Yeah. But that first year, of course, a 42 goal, a 42 block lead certainly has helped Mike keep the record in the way that he has from Ryan. But he knows yeah. that over the course, again, of a decade that, it, that Ryan has been the guy. I also want to give a few flowers to Brett and Tan as well, who has seamlessly fit in to that empire D line. He has guarded one of the two or three more difficult initiating cutters usually. So that means that he has got to cover the deep space, which he's done well with. And it means he has to pressure the in cuts. And I think Brett and Tan is again, fit seamlessly in, uh, especially to a player that did not play in the AUDL for three seasons. He's been gone since again, the 2019 season with Toronto. And even on that team, he was one of their big defenders, but he wasn't one of the legend names. If that makes sense. He was kind of that, that middle generation that was supposed to help, transition them into what would have been their next dynasty. But again, that never came for Toronto pandemic, everything they got, they, they really restarted everything getting rather young. But the point is Brett and Tan was, you know, we'll say late to the big winning years for Toronto. And I don't think he got as much credit being with that rush team that, yeah, he would have, especially with New York then in 2018, taking over the 2018, 2019, when Brett and Tan was also a main figure for those D lines for Toronto. But yeah, he has been, uh, as as seamless into that D line as you could possibly expect for a player who kind of just met their teammates, what three months ago or something. Yeah, any anytime you can just kind of fit in and you almost don't notice who's where on the defense at certain points in all of these games, you know that it's a player who's out there doing an amazing job. Um, you know, not necessarily a ton of highlights. I know he swatted that one, but. You know, he's just out there doing an amazing job. And sometimes that's, it goes unsung when you're shutting people down, you're just denying the cuts rather than getting the blocks. Yeah. And so I think it's, you know, the other DC podcast we went like 30 minutes with, but we can actually, I think, shorten this one a little bit just because I, as I was texting the coaches, I don't want to galaxy brain this. I think Philadelphia, as we said, are a good team. They made some adjustments, Mott handled a bit more. They won every 50 50 ball up in the air because they have elite elite Huck receivers in Martin and in Pollard. That's why that's part of what they do well. And that's what Philly, I think, of course, especially being down 0-4 now in the schedule, I expect Philly to maybe become the most Huck Hackby team in the entire league, just because if that's who they choose to be, they want to go down fighting. Even at 0-4, they want to go down that way with all those Hucks. So I, I think that, especially without Osgar, again, nothing more to talk about the O-line. I think we cover all those bases. Yeah. <laughs> Babbitt, monster in the end zone, right? And it's like, you don't need to really... Even though Philly pushed them to overtime, 18-16, they needed to figure things out. They needed to win that game. It's kind of the same thing we said with DC between Babbitt and even Ryan Dross. Like he's not a star per se, but the Empire still find ways to make enough star plays when they need to. Even with Ryan Oscar, even when one of their main stars out, they still have enough guys. They make enough star plays over the course of a full game. It is difficult. The Philly Phoenix took a 11-9 lead into halftime. 
they should have felt like they deserve that game. And I think for most other teams that aren't New York, that's exactly the point. Philadelphia win that game. They deserve to win the game. Their O-line played well enough to win the game. Their D-line had more takeaways in the first half, and they deserve to win that game. But going 48 minutes with the New York Empire plus is very, very difficult. And again, I don't want to galaxy brain it. I'm saying the, the ways that Philly did really well, compliments to them, pushing the Empire to OT. And, and I would say, too, where last season it felt like the Empire weren't troubled in this way. But in the same regard, the DC game and then this one, again, simple ways. Philly improved, and DC is also better than maybe they were last year. And I think that they're, it's a, they're able to, they close the gap a little bit, but the Empire is still the better team. Yeah. Um, I do have a question for you. Uh, both like kind of a league wide structure thing, and then maybe a little tiny specific about this game. So, uh, the Empire coaching staff tended to call timeouts pretty early when the defense got the disc. Um, personally, I think they should have let that breathe a little bit more. Again, they put Yacht over there for impact on offense, and then they didn't really give him a chance to do anything. I think he completed one throw all game, and he scored the last goal in overtime when the game was technically already decided Empire was going to win. That was just a throw at the buzzer that he scored. Um, mm-hmm. I feel like leaving the offense – the, the D line offense out there a little bit also would have tired out that Philly O line a little, you know, Philly kept getting the rest they needed then to just come back and keep punching and making those amazing deep shots. And, you know, you don't have those mental mistakes if they're not tired. I curious to hear your thoughts on that a little bit. And then kind of the larger scale of that, the new clock rule, the clock runs a little bit more frequently. So the games are a tiny bit shorter so using all four of your timeouts to sub the offense back onto the field and get your defense off the field, we're almost not seeing any of these D-line guys play as much as I would like. Um, you know, yeah, the offense, star-driven, whatever, but, you know, it's a shame that we aren't seeing, you know, guys, you know, one through seven on defense or, you know, even some of the other subs play like a little bit more because there are still a lot of stars on a lot of teams who – are on defense and they're really just getting like yanked off the field the second they get a chance to play. And yeah, I don't know. I feel like the timeouts with the new clock, it, uh, yeah. I don't know. Well, I think it, it, it's interesting because I think when watching as many games I try to watch, I think it's almost a per team basis where I think if you're the, and I'm going to miss a team here, but if you're the empire, if you're Colorado, if definitely those two, I think if you're to a point Atlanta and Carolina, And of course, DC, if you're one of those five D lines, you can look around and say there are players who would be playing O line major minutes for almost everybody else in this league. And our D line can be trusted to do that. Where I think for the Empire D line, especially, yeah, when you have Yacht, when you have Katz, when you have JR, you have Antoine, you have Marquez, you have players that have played primarily on O line for different teams or even for the Empire in the past. And so I think the Empire aren't a, a, or Empire fans, particularly in a situation where, they say this is a we trust our D line to be able to get those those breaks and they have before and I think today uh, against Philadelphia to your point as well their break percentage four of 19, 21 percent was easily the lowest of this season and I think the lowest since I'm not sure which game last year but like week eight or week seven or whatever last year I think it was the Ottawa game actually where that break percentage was that low because the Empire D line yeah they do that they take the disc away and then they convert and I think the takeaways yesterday. I, it was skewed for the second half, but the, the, the D-line didn't really take the disc away. And you're right. In the moments that they did, it was almost an instant timeout. And, and I think that the Empire coaching staff, the thinking is that we're, not say we're down, but we want to give our, our O-line the confidence even. Like maybe it's less even about the D-line than just saying we want to, it was an O-line that wasn't clicking without Osgar. So we want to give our O-line the confidence to do their job, right? In, in, in that juncture yesterday. But yeah, for sure. I think it's like, again, a weird thing around the league where, if I'm, I don't want to disparage any D lines, but there are many D lines around the league where if I'm a coach, I'm calling timeout because my O line handlers or toe line players, especially again, O line handlers are just so much better than my D line handlers. Like it's just night and day. We've got to get those handlers back out there because we really only have three or four or five throwers on the entire team where the empire again are just in a position of, uh, let's say a, a privilege, but they are, they're in a position of privilege to have Ben Katz and uh, even Marquez working in that space, and Ethan Fortin working in that space, and then Mike, uh, Handler Mike, when he, when he comes over, and Mike Dross to do that. I mean, I also think, too, like not to throw away your topic, but I think the end-of-the-quarter stuff is just as important, especially with these shortened games, 
because I felt the same thing watching these games. It feels like the quarter, the end of quarter smacks you in the face with that clock running faster than it has in the past for some reason. And that was to me, even a bigger thing in this game than it was even the timeouts that were taken. Philly won the first two end of quarters. So they took the half 11, nine. Then New York won the third when Jack put up that floating scuba and Babbitt came down with it over Charles Weinberg. Poor Charles. Like, I hope he shakes that one off. And then, because, well, Jeff kind of started screaming, not knowing it was Charles. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah. When he, he kind of looks at him, when he goes, pulled him oh, up, it, he's yeah. like, he still has his arm attached. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, but Charles, I, maybe I just lay there. Maybe I just like yeah. kinda, put a Philly guy on top of me and say, all right, you know, it's fine. But then the other wild Jack throw was, as I said, that Huck to Jar with 30 seconds. 36 seconds left to go. And that's not an end of quarter play, but that is with a high stall count in a pressure situation. And you do have Jack Williams for that stuff. But again, the, one of the recipes as Daryl Stanley said last year against, against uh, New York is that even in the playoff game last year, DC wound up winning the end of the quarter in the third quarter. And they wound up winning. Uh, they got a break, I think on a time after a timeout. And that's how you get New York. You, you pip New York by winning the end of the quarters, just getting that, that we'll say that free point. Yeah, And not even by getting the goal yourself, by denying them the goal like they did, I believe, at the end of the first quarter, did Philadelphia, where New York just, they weren't able to answer. And so then you go and you, you're now you're, you've got that plus one on serve. You're in a good spot. And that's, I think, the recipe to beat New York, because they're going to be with you the entire game. You're not going to be able to get any space, any distance, even if you get a three-goal lead. Now they have two more. Let's say you get a three-goal lead in the second. Then you've got two more quarters. You have to win, because then that's a plus two for New York, because of their, they're so good at end of quarter end of quarters the, the breaks and i think that that to me is so much more important where the clock moving so quickly teams have got to be aware on not a giving new york enough time but b you've also just got to win those 50 50s when again you have a plus or a plus one or a plus minus when everybody's going up for the disc yeah I, winning those 50 50s is going to be hard for the most part i think just finding a way yeah. to manage the clock and either don't give them a good shot or you know, give them so much time that you have another shot. Yeah, it's uh, it's tough. It's not easy. Yeah, and I think New York, that's why they scored with 36 seconds left. They, they're like, okay, we're going to go up and we either win this game here. Like, we don't care if there's 36 seconds for Philly. And good on Philly to tie it up, to send it to OT with that time left. And then the Empire in overtime, they just took care of business. Again, like once it went to OT, you knew that you had some confidence in them as well. So yeah, I mean, I think we, we did go 30 minutes because it is interesting that Two games in a row overtime, the Empire, as I started this show, saying they look mortal for the first time in a long time, but they're still undefeated. They're still the best team in this league. And I think it's more credit even to the East Division as to just how difficult these games are. And it's so interesting, too, because I think the West has a lot of good teams that they've shown so far, but almost every one of those games are not close. Like You're talking, even if they wind up being three or four, I believe it was the, the Austin game this weekend against, what was it, San Diego? I mean, they were up by like eight or something or seven, and they closed it to three or four by the end of it. But a lot of these games out West are just blowouts that turn into garbage time, you know, closer scores than they really are. But in the East, you got to fight for every goal. Like, I mean, now the Empire in back-to-back games has scored less than 20. And you'd be concerned about the O-line that way. Maybe you are without Osgar, but not say it's not too much concern, but I'm not concerned because I watched the games. And I can tell you just how good DC was and how good Philadelphia was. And that's why that game was close. Yeah. Last word for you? Uh, nah, <laughs> nah. <No. laughs> I think we saw. Well, I, guess I think we summed it all up. Uh, I'm looking forward to Empire's road trip. That's about it. Yeah, I mean, I think that would be the last word. That the Empire now have a week again. The health of Ryan Osgar, I think, will probably be the storyline. Should be one of the storylines around the league. Let's see how he recovers, and it might not be anything. So against Boston, against Montreal, the Empire hitting the road for that uh, that that double header. And you've done, yeah, I mean, I guess that last question for you. I mean, you've done it, but without the Boston part of it, but what's the difference between, I guess it's, I guess it's better of a, a break. It's only like the four hour drive, four or five hour drive up to Boston. And then you, you finish your way up to Montreal, which is pretty far. Yeah. Four or five hours. Later, but I have to look at a map to see how, yeah, the Boston to Montreal, but some of those road trips were, they were fine. I mean, we make the most of it on the bus and team always treats us well with the food and the accommodations and everything, but sometimes it is tiring. But. Yeah, I mean, the good. I guess the good news for AEDL fans and oh, I'd say Empire fans too is now the Boston Glory are going to be likely heading into that game through a, what a four and or three and depending on what the, the result is this weekend. Um, so yeah, I, I think Boston is going to be a bigger test than originally they were uh, expected to be, 
And if you're the Empire too, that you've you've been tested so far twice with or, well at least once with Philadelphia plus one in the rain, and then once by DC, and with then Atlanta on June 10th, as we remember, then that Colorado Salt Lake trip. The Empire schedule is is difficult as well. So to have two OT games already. And with a bunch of the top of the league teams left to go again, Salt Lake's five and zero, Colorado's four and zero, Atlanta just took their first loss against Carolina. So I think there's going to be a lot of exciting games down the stretch. And if the Empire won a repeat, they're going to have to earn it. So thank you so much for being with us again after this Week Four recap. And there's no other YouTube video coming out this week, so don't worry. Take your time to watch this one uh, and maybe watch it again. I don't know. And then next week we'll again prepare you for Boston and Montreal. We'll have all that preview stuff going on there as well as. Matt and I will be back the following week to talk about that doubleheader. So thanks so much, Matt, again, for joining me and for you and the entire Empire family. We'll see you soon.